Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Underground Knowledge. I'm James Morcan and I'm here today in Sydney, Australia. It's a beautiful day. I thought I'd go for a walk while I record this. It's middle of winter here, so it's pretty chilly, but it is a beautiful day. Not a cloud in the sky. Um, so, sorry I haven't recorded for a while. I've been busy with stuff, but I've been thinking about been thinking about the state of the world a lot of people have been I don't know I'm sensing people are becoming more and more the divisions between political beliefs are becoming more and more extreme and I'm noticing that people are angrier and angrier and I think some of that anger anger is correct but I guess I've been thinking about how to, how do, in, I'm thinking about things on an individual level, how do individuals, what is the best way to approach the political environment we're in? And there's numerous ways to do that. Some people shut off. You know, you could call those, some people might say those sort of people have their head buried in the sand. I'm, and I'm sure you know those sort of people who, and I'm not necessarily putting them down or saying that's wrong, but the sort of people who don't watch or don't pay attention to the news, um, don't care about politics, all that stuff. And within that group, some of those people would, um, some of those people would be people who don't care about society or anything beyond themselves but I also believe <clears throat> there are other people within those groups who have have their reasons and I'll get to that later in this podcast and so my thinking about all this is uh, I'm, I'm processing it myself I think it's a confusing error so I don't want any of this to seem like oh hey I've got the answers because <laughs> I don't I don't believe not only myself, but I don't believe, not only f about myself, but I don't believe any one person can have the answers on these complex, um, the complex world we're in now, the modern world. I don't believe any one person can give you the answers on politics or whatever it may be, religion, any, anything at all. So I think it's always a case of we have to cobble it together from various people and some people will be right about 90% of things but then you have to be prepared to throw out the 10% that you go no that's just flat out wrong um, so yeah it's really just an ex this is really just me thinking it through aloud and it's exploratory and hopefully um, you might take something out of it as I go um, so the world we're in now we're faced with this dilemma where politicians, no matter what, <laughs> what they promise, what they say, what, you know, I don't, you know, Obama in 2008 said, you know, change can still happen. Yes, we can. All that. What did he do? To me, in my opinion, that was basically like Bush 2.0. If you take away all the glit all the statements, all the, you know, the differing personality, and that's another thing I want to get to is the focusing on personality of politicians. Mm, not sure about that. Um, but, you know, once you take away all that and you just actually break it down to what he did, so he bailed out the private institutions, spent a trillion dollars of US taxpayers' money ahead of people who were going under individuals that were going bankrupt, that were going homeless, all that. He, he bailed out private institutions, trillion dollars, those, those were not government banks, right? There you go, boom, here's a trillion dollars. Uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't stop those wars. He, they were scaling down anyway. Yeah, did, were they ending towards the, the end of his thing? Yes, but that would have happened organically under anyone probably, um, meaning, meaning that those wars were getting very old anyway. Uh, and I know there's reasons, I know people who are, and this gets back to what I'm talking about, about the extreme divide where people think one side is Democrats are totally right or left wing and other countries are totally right or that right wing Republicans 
or Tories in the UK are always 100% right. It's like this silly charade that we go through. Um, where people make it, I know, I realize that people make excuses for Obama saying he was, um, you know, roadblocked and all that, but I, I and I, and I accept, I, I know at least enough about US politics to know that when you've got a, when you're up against it in the Senate, even if you're president, they can block certain policies. I at least know enough about that to know some of that is true, but I don't believe you can just make a total, total excuses about him. So I'm not, and I'm not, this isn't an anti, I'm, I'm, I, I need to state here now that I'm, I would either be categorized as, if I have to be categorized politically, it would be centrist. So I'm in the middle and I believe there's good and bad and right and left politics and you need to take the best of all. And that's what, that's my concern with going, it's making a stand and saying, I am this, I'm that. It's, I, I don't think any one person, when you really nail them down, I don't think they actually are ever completely left wing or completely right. Um, and so this isn't an attack on Obama or anything like that or the left. And this is, this is definitely not going to be a pro-Trump thing either. But I would say that if he really wanted to make change, you, you, we can't make excuses to, to, for him to the point that, no, no, he couldn't do it. You know, they blocked. Well, why is it that Trump can do it? I understand he's got a different, he's got a greater majority or something like that. But hey, how hard can it be? So I believe what, what we've got is we've got these people who are telling us one thing, but then they've really got a hidden agenda be behind that. That's happening time and time again. I mean, I saw that in the UK with Tony Blair. So he followed a, a horrible bordering on far right uh, administration in the, in the Thatcher government that lasted for a decade, I think probably close to 20 years, I think, at least 15. He came in and they said, this guy's going to be fair. He's going to bring in some, you know, social justice that, or social welfare, I guess you could call it, or, or, or elements of socialism within the, keeping the capitalist system intact, but elements of socialism because Thatcher had eroded so much of that. He turned out to be in the, and, the, and they called him, that, so the Labour Party is in the UK is the equivalent of the Democrats in the US. And he called that new, he called that new Labour. And it was, Herald, all the artists were behind it, all the, the equivalent of Hollywood in the UK was all behind him. They, you know, this was supposedly the great messiah, very, very, very similar to Obama. Uh, he seemed modern, he seemed like this has changed. He was the most warmongering, um, you know, that he was basically right, right wing in a bad way. Uh, and he continued a lot of Thatcher's stuff. Uh, and it's sort of like, okay, he did some good things, but then the, the thing that strikes me with politics is they, you get, you get good stuff one way, but then you, they deceive you in the way that you don't, you hadn't foreseen. And in the end of the day, whoever you support it, all, it, it all works out about the same. Pretty much in post-World War II politics, I would be stretched to think anyone in, in developed countries, um, I think Gandhi was still alive in India post-World War II, maybe he died about 49, 47. I mean, I think we'd have to go that far back to really find the sort of people we're looking for. I just don't see, um, Kennedy didn't live long enough and he would be one that I would like to believe uh, <clears throat> stood for the common people. And I think he made bold, it would need someone that, see, that's the other problem is it would need someone that brave as well, because what you're really talking about, by my, by my estimates and others I've read too, who people with greater knowledge than myself, who I believe are really in the know about estimating black budgets as well and all the stuff that goes down, you know, like for example, when the US or the West, let's not, let's not just single out America because uh, the West is involved in this too, as we've seen with particularly Britain, even here in Australia, supporting certain wars. When we invade these countries, we've got 
we've got their mineral resources long term, but not just when we invade them, but, but via things like the IMF and the World Bank. When we screw these countries down, these thir so-called third world countries, which is a term I hate because some of them should be the richest on earth, and in terms of their resources they've got, they actually technically are if you break it down. Uh, when, we, when we screw these third world countries with these loans and sink them in a sea of debt, we own their resources long term. So when you factor all that in, the best estimates I've heard with with one administration in the US, so meaning a four a four year presidential administration, quadrillions of dollars, so not billions, not trillions, quadrillions of dollars go down. That's how much it's worth. That they go that, that amount of money, quadrillions of dollars, goes down every presidential term. So <laughs> my question is, do you really think that they're just gonna say Let's say some guy just comes up out of nowhere, okay? And he and for some reason and he's out he's and I know everyone claims to be outside the establishment or that like like Obama, like Trump. It's we find out it's all bullshit every time. But let's say there was a really a guy who said number one, he would have to be like Jesse Ventura in that whatever you think of Jesse Ventura, that's irrelevant, but he was the only governor of a state who became elected to a state without, he refused to take any, let me get this right, I've just got to remember, I think he refused to take any donations from corporations, but it might have been individuals too, but I'm pretty sure, no, I think it was just corporations, okay? And after this, the CIA actually interviewed him because they wanted to find out how the hell he did this, okay? so. I believe to become, to really be independent, you would have to, because all these special interests own you. You don't just, you have to agree to stuff. It may not be, I, I'm not sure if it's contra signing contracts, but you have to agree to a lot of stuff before you get in power. So those agreements are basically against the common people because the common people are just voting for a guy who says, right, I'm going to represent your best interest. But you can't do that if you agree. So they're so... They've got so much lust for power, they are prepared to. Um, they are prepared to make these concessions and go with these special interests. And of course, then when it comes to doing the right thing for the people, they just can't do that because they've already agreed to so many things. So vent the Ventura way is to actually say no. When I get voted in, I will have no. I don't. I'm not beholden to anyone. Okay. So let's say there was a guy like Ventura, and he's at the presidential level or the prime minister level in the British politics. Those are the two main pl power players of um, world politics, I believe. So if you take, but let's just stick with the U.S. right. So if quadrillions of dollars go down every four years with the with each administration, do you really think? Whoever's reaping the benefits of the, scoring that those all those black budgets, all that under the table, um, what could you say? Like it's ancillary benefits or just a spin-off from presidency, which is okay. So whoever the groups are, and you can you can call them whatever secret site, whatever you want to call them, but they're you're talking a shadow government or whoever. Do you really think they would just say, well, hang on, this guy called Ventura has come up, he hasn't got this, but but no, we've got to let we've got to let democracy work. <laughs> it's just like the height of and it would be if quid quadrillions of dollars are going down every presidential term, how dumb do people have to be to say, Well, no, this can still happen, this can work. And I'm not denying don't get me wrong, I'll get to this. I do believe there's ways that you'd have to challenge the entire system to make it work. And I do always I don't believe in this idea that, you know, um, that that shadow groups who are in the extreme minority, of course, I don't believe that they are any any sort of match if the common people unite. So I'm not someone who sits back and goes, Oh, you know, there's all these, you got this, you know, there's sort of people who sit around and talk about the Illuminati and all that stuff and just say, well, these groups are there, we can't, you know, we're all doomed. I'm not like that at all. But I think in order to activate our true power and actually enforce democracy, we would have to unite, but, but we can't unite until we become aware of all these things. And I believe the awareness of the way 
the system actually works is the way to get rid of all this not it, it'll never completely get rid of the divisiveness of groups and in a way the divisiveness is natural people have differing opinions and that sort of clash is sort of democracy in action but what i mean is when it goes so extreme some of that is we're all being misled down different directions and then we get dis when we do get a guy in power like obama <sighs> Um, for the Democrats or like Trump now for the Republicans, um, they always disappoint. Trump is going to disappoint the if he hasn't already, <laughs> he's going to disappoint the hell out of people. And it's off, sometimes it's not until after they're out that we see what they've really done. Um, so I got off on a tangent there. Let me <laughs> let me think if I can think what I was saying. Oh yeah, so. Do you really think that they would just say, uh, allow, the, you know, they would just say, well, I mean, in the US, you've got two parties, or, and really, to my mind, it's one party. They're both, one thing that needs to be said about US politics is basically the Democrats on the globe, on the Western scale, or the global scale, political scale, would be far right. I'm sorry, but that's how far they've ventured. I'm not saying they're fascists, but I'm saying that's very, very right wing. The the Democrats used to be maybe on their world scale, maybe there was a time in the 70s, I think, up until the 70s, sorry, where they were at best you could say center left. I don't I don't think US politics ever really had a left wing party. Um, and all this talk about <laughs> Bernie Sanders, he just has a couple of socialist ideas within a capitalist um, framework he's proposing and a right wing framework. And suddenly he's, but in US politics, he's suddenly called a communist. <laughs> it's just laughable. And, th and those policies, by the way, are all the ones like here in Australia, in, I've lived in the UK as well. Um, you know, those, the po sort of policies he's talking about, most of them are already in place, if not more so, in our countries. And our countries are not left wing either. So you could, that's the missing thing is that you can have countries like Japan, um, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, they prove that you can definitely have socialism within a capitalist system. And the, tr the two are not mutually exclusive. They don't cancel each other out. And actually, some socialist ideas are actually necessary to keep capitalism going. Now, for example, many people believe, many people in Silicon Valley and Wall Street are calling for, uh, what's it called? The income, the basic income. So that, that means that everyone gets a wage no matter what. They get a minimum wage, sorry. So that means that, and that allows us to eradicate certain things like certain amounts of social welfare, less, we can spend less on healthcare and different things. But it also means the reason why it's a socialist and a capitalist venture is that what it actually means is that you can keep capitalism needs workers right sometimes workers die sometimes workers get so sick because they haven't got enough money so actually keeping them alive and keeping them to a degree where they can at least healthy enough that they can work is actually a capitalist thing so it's, but it is a socialist thing as well so there's many things like that where they don't cancel each other out and i think often with it needs to be said that often with with US politics, there's a bit of a problem with some of these things in that the I've, I've lived in America as well, and here's one of the things is that the US economy and the US population and what's going down in America is so huge that Americans are not generally worldly, and that is not a put down. It sounds like it, but it's not because there's so much going on in America that you you guys actually don't need to um, you don't need to be as aware of the rest of the world, and also you don't often the economy at least until now. Maybe this is going to change from now on, but at least until 2018 now, Americans haven't needed to go overseas to better themselves. Uh, and most other countries in the world, even some British will go to the US, even German people will go elsewhere. Uh, and that's, so it's really, a, and it's nothing, it doesn't make America any better, it doesn't make it any worse, it's just literally 
Amer- you got to remember, the English-speaking world got the jump on a lot of the rest of the world. The West is ultra powerful, and so which is the which is the country that has the biggest population within all that? It's the U.S. Like it's got almost six times the population of Britain, and a lot of that's often forgotten in the hoopla of patriotism and all that jazz. It's really just literally. And, and I'm not denying, I, I think there's many things that's special about the US, but if Britain had a population of 300 million, it would be equally as powerful. And so, and I believe also the people would be less worldly because of that. So what that's led to is politicians are able to say things like against people like Bernie Sanders who want just what the rest of the, every developed nation in the Western world had something like uh, universal health care. Just a, that's barely a socialist venture. It's just... It's just anything you do if you care for your population, just just a minor thing like that. What the politicians in America are able to do and fool the American public is to say, wow, no, they've tried that in Italy or that doesn't. And they give, give all these ra- little random examples. Uh, whereas if, if, um, if more Americans lived in other countries, were aware of it, if more of your news was was global, then, then it wouldn't be so easy to fool a percent a big percentage of the population but right now there's just um it there's a there's a gap in knowledge there and i think that'll change but they're, they're able to do scare tactics against that side now i'm not a um overall i'm not i'm definitely not for i'm, I'm a capitalist and this is where i i when i talk about i'm a centrist and i believe in the the politics the best politics of all taking the best of all sides and leaving the worst i've just talked about a number of socialist things but i'm not a i'm not proposing a totally socialist economy because or political framework because i can see the i've seen enough with the bad sides of that when you go too far so it's a balance um so What I really think is that when, if you put all that together, uh, people like people who have no affiliation with any one side, and they're just let's say they form an independent third party. Well, as I said, quadrillions of dollars go down each. Pre- so it would be the dumbest. It would literally be the dumbest. Uh, business move in the history of, of making money so we so a lot of this a lot of modern politics i believe is about follow the money so when you under, when you really break all this down and go holy shit so they're so they're making that much there's that huge fortunes going down every presidential term then we've got to, then you've got to open up to the idea that we've got a rigged political system and that we've got we don't have democracy. We just believe we do. And all this voting, what are you really voting for? Like you would believe each time, okay, this has changed, this has changed. But it, but how much contrast have we had in the post-World War II era? Like what is what is changing? What, you know, eight years goes down. Obama was supposedly changed. Now Trump has supposedly changed. What is actually changing for the common people is what I'm, I'm focused on. And so... My whole thing with all this is we've got to be very careful as individuals in how we approach this modern world. And I understand a lot of people are angry about Trump now. And don't get me wrong, I'm not going to defend him. And I always thought he was an asshole long before he was in power. I also think the the cult, the focusing on personalities of politicians is um it's kind of the equivalent of the cult of personality we've got now with celebrities where that become you know for here's an example is people don't like an individual an individual artist, let's say, so they now lo- no longer can listen to their music because it's um, because no, they didn't like what they said. Now, now, don't get me wrong. There are some cases where someone goes so extreme that I can't forget about that. But I think for every case like that, you know, let's say we got someone who's a 
he's a celebrity he's a he's a great artist but let's say he's a he becomes a convicted pedophile or rapist or murderer those are ones extreme ones sure where where that does i i would either boycott or i can't shut it off when i watch certain things like that when i watch um certain films or listen to certain music by an artist who's been proven to be those kind of criminals okay but for everyone like that there's also a number of people but we live in a world now where it's sort of trial by social media and there's a number of others where we when their hysteria dies down what did they really do and they might have done something bad but don't get me wrong but it's not on the level of um maybe no one was hurt by it it was just they'd broken a rule of society or so you know it might might be anything that really when the hysteria dies down what did they actually do and have any of you listening can you say that you haven't you know ever said something like that or ever you know so i'm and so that sort of ties in that analogy of the way we you know just shut down certain artists because they say one thing or whatever that's sort of coming into um politics now and i think that's does it just we really should just be focusing on their policies um, <clears throat> and I, I think that does a disservice to politics and stuff when we we break it down to just what is their personality like and for example I, I've just mentioned before that I believe JFK and his brother were had everything we would want now or almost everything in a politician even though I know enough about those guys to know they were probably assholes in many other ways um, not just the way they dealt with women but there was various other things in their private lives I don't care I don't care what they did in their private lives I'm more interested in when they stand there there's some there was something about the Kennedys for example where <sighs> I think they had a selfish side, they had a dark side, they had indulge. I, I think indulgent would summarize them the best. They weren't saints like some people make out, but there was something about them that when they stood on the platform, when it came to selling out the people, maybe maybe a part of them wanted the money to, you know, take a take a million dollars just to keep quiet on behalf of some corporation. But I think there was something in the Kennedys where at the end of the day they just couldn't do it. They just and now we're we're struggling to find anyone who can actually can say god damn i'm not gonna sell the people out here we, you know we, we we can't find that sort of we can't find that sort of person so what i'm getting at here is this whole thing about the um the personality of uh you know trying to uh, you got to remember there's massive corporate interests that are behind digging up dirt on people some people have more dirt than others and some people there's a reason and i think bill clinton would be an example of this where he was an example where there was a lot of dirt about him but it never comes out until late in their presidency actually i've just realized okay he had the I've just remembered he had the Monica Lewinsky scandal, but overall, and that didn't really turn, it wasn't like, um, that might have been an attempt to remove him by by players higher up, or it may have just happened organically, we don't know. But overall, Bill Clinton had high approval rating, and it's not until years after that we really see that guy could have been a monster like Hillary. You know, and there's a lot of dirt around him, there's a lot of when you dig deeper into all sorts of shady stuff with that couple but but while he's in power none of that seems to come out and other people a lot comes out to stop them getting in power so what we've got to be aware of is i don't believe we can get the totality of an in, of a politician's personality um, I don't believe we can get the totality of a politician's personality while they're in while they're in power or even at all um, it's kind of again to, to come back to celebrities or other public figures it's similar to that someone can be held in such high regard their entire life and then you get some autobiography and not the sort of scandalous sorry not autobiography biography after they die 
and not I'm not talking scandalous stuff, but let's say the sort of biography that's really well researched and actually talks about stuff that they can prove, and you find out, man, that person was nothing like what I thought. So half the time it's what they want us to see. I also think there are some people who are masters at, and I can confirm I've known some famous types in the in my industry, in the film industry, who <laughs> to, well, it goes both ways. There, there's some that would be uh, held up as saints, and I can I can absolutely tell you they're not. And there's others that almost everyone despises, or they've got a huge. They really divide people, and they've got a lot of enemies. And uh, and I've seen nothing but um, the antithesis with their with their personalities when they didn't need to. It wasn't in situations where they needed to reveal. They were they were trying to impress or anything like that. And I've seen a, a real good side in a number of these people, so that's why I don't really listen or care to any of that stuff, because the point is, who's telling it? Like, the media is telling us this is... Okay, so... And I also think by getting us focusing on that, it's pretty much saying to us, don't worry about policies anymore. What is this person but like? You know, let me show you the dirt, or let me show you the good side in this person whatever they want us to see. Um, and I think Trump is a guy that doesn't try to conceal his... Maybe, maybe he can't because he's such an asshole. <laughs> he, can't, he can't hide his, um, that side of himself. But also what I'm getting at here is it's not so much to defend Trump, but to say these people before who've come before are just masters at be looking stately, looking presidential, all that. Um, some people just had that in spades. So I think we need to... I don't, I don't think the... At this late stage with how much control, how rigged the system is, all the special interest groups around them, number one, I don't think we should be focusing on personalities, but number two, I think it's at the stage where even the individuals up for it are not really, unless they came with an entire new framework and said, look, we're not going to take, like the Venturi way, we're not going to take money from special interests, so meaning we're not going to sell out beforehand. Um, even then that could be, they could disguise, you know, there's ways to do that, a bit like what Trump, how he fooled people and said he's he's outside of the swamp and all that jazz he's outside of the political framework it's not a it's not about it's more about being an elitist and trump was always one of the, one of the ultimate elitists in terms of he never said anything um before he ran for long before he ran for president if you follow his stuff there was never anything about yeah i'm gonna it was all about himself he's a narcissist and it's not but what i'm getting at is i don't believe uh, I don't believe actually that he is any worse than the people who have come before him. I just think he's more of the same, but he's more, in a way it's good because I think it's driving anger, the right sort of anger, um, or some of the right sort of anger and that in a way he is, he is so obvious, whereas the others were such good, um, disguises of their true, their true allegiances which is with elitists but in a way he's so obvious that i think it can help people wake up but in another way what i'm worried about is that people are sort of thinking this guy is an asshole so therefore we need to remove him there's going to be unless we change the whole system or unless we work outside the system which is my whole thing then there's going to be no change but it always seems as if just like after bush people were so angry blah, 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 blah. It seemed like this is it. What happened, it's same as every other time, since pretty much since in Western politics, since the end of World War II, and you can, once a, you know, you can post your comments below and tell me examples of where you believe, if, I, if I'm wrong, tell me where there's been real, a real uh, political leader in the Western world who's been in power and has represented the people for most of us, um, presidency or years in power, prime ministership. Uh, tell me who that person is, and and as I said, maybe 
I brought up Gandhi in India. Um, that's not in the Western world, but still, it's aligned with us. Uh, and then I could, you know, the Kennedy JFK was in power for like two, maybe two and a half years. Uh, we did need to see him. I think I think he would have easily won the next presidential campaign. So he would have had eight years. That would have been then we would have got a clearer picture. But as but I think that's the next best bet. And then I just see nothing. There's just nothing. And I don't always know it's, if it's the fault of the individuals, whether they're just working in such a rigged system and they give up, um, or or whether it's the it's a bit of it's a bit of both whether it's the system itself and again I'm not saying I've got many if any answers here but these are my opinions at least so um, so that's my take on Trump that I don't think he's any worse than any of these others now we've got to remember under Obama he went he not only bailed out those private banks he he also went to war in Libya, which was totally unnecessary. He didn't shut down those wars there earlier. And I can't think of, now people say, okay, so he was blocked on the um, healthcare stuff and that, but that's a moot point. Like, was he really prepared to shake things up? You know, I just don't see, I don't think it's, a, and, and even if, let's say if I'm wrong, let's say if, <clears throat> let's say if, Trump is marginally worse than <coughs> if he's worse than and I would argue he's got to start some war before he can get in the league of Obama and Bush he's actually got to start some wars because that's the most destructive and he's got to um, he's probably got to do something as horrible as spending a trillion dollars of taxpayers money to bail out private institutions a lot of which have foreign allegiances he's probably got to do something that extreme before i put him in the obama camp now do i think he's capable of that yeah and let's so let's say after four or eight years he's done 20 10 20 percent worse than bush and obama heaven forbid well where does that leave us it's still there's going to be another guy to follow up he's going to be no better um he's going to be when I, when I say no better, I mean he's going to be promising all this change, all that. He's going to, he will have a sort of a, he will, the problem is the next guy who follows up, because Trump is dividing people so much and there's a lot of hatred brewing, not just in the US, but especially internationally, where he's, he must have the lowest, globally, he must have the lowest approval rating um, of, a, of a US president ever. <laughs> Uh, cause his poli cause his stances clash with so much of the rest of even the Western world. Um, so the next, the problem is the next person will have a beautiful situation to just come in and take a lot of liberties because they'll put, so it could be someone who just looks so presidential again, like Obama or Bill Clinton and says everything right. But then they, there would be a lot of uh, leeway for them to really push things under the radar, I believe. So that's my, so anyway, that's my whole take on the situation we're in now. And again, I'm not saying we're all doomed. This is the thing is where sometimes if people ask me, I, I just say I'm apolitical. That's my stance. And I don't believe, I, I, I don't, recommend that people vote because I think it's a waste of time and it's pretty much giving your power to the whole system because not only when you okay vote but that's okay but when you when people get caught up in this whole stuff what I'm concerned about is that change has to happen on an individual level as well or maybe change can only work when we change as individuals I think the political system is kind of like um it's kind of like either an accidental or purposeful mind control and that we get caught up in all this stuff and it would be worth it. Don't get me wrong. If, if after people were so, don't forget people were just as angry under Bush as under Trump. Okay. I believe that's when you, when you factor in the wars that were going down under, under Bush, right? So people were so angry they'd 
they were celeb a lot of people were celebrating when Obama got in power. It's like God had come down to earth. And yet and so you invest all that energy, all that discussion, all that and I'm worried about the people feeling helpless as well. And I don't believe we are, and I'm gonna get to that in a minute. But that's why my concern is that what does it do what does this whole thing do on an individual level to us? Uh, and therefore um, when people say to me, oh, so it's, they, they reply, oh, okay, so you're apolitical, so you don't care about, it's like, no, no, my, my thinking, I don't say anything, but my thinking would be, I'm apolitical because I do care about society and about people, okay? And I think the politics has become a useless venture, and I don't believe that politics can be, I think for the time being, we can't use politics to get what we want okay I think it can be restructured in the long term but or the medium term hopefully uh, but for the time being I think it's a ginormous waste of time and it's sort of and I think if we uh, turn our and I, I believe this will happen naturally and I think you can see this with young people now where sure there would be an element that uh annoyed with Trump but I believe overall the younger generations and even even people who are not even vote not old enough to vote now I believe these people it's kind of like what's happened to organized religions gradually compared to uh, more mature mature generations gradually they are becoming um, in fact, it's very similar to organized religions because the young people are just as spiritual as the older generations, but they will not, they get that outside of religion. Now, there would have been, a, this is not a bad analogy, I believe, in that there would have been a time in society where if you said, are you religious? And then if you said no, then you're an atheist or a non-believer or a heathen or, you know. But now we've got to the point where we've basically restructure that as a society where we can say well hang on it's you can be we, we understand now that for someone like myself for example I'm very spiritual but I'm I don't believe in organized religions I don't subscribe to that I think it's more a political thing if you research in history that's my opinion but I think even even if you think I'm wrong about that you can most people can hear that and go oh yeah you can still be religion he can still believe in God but he's outside of he's not practicing organized religions and I believe it'll be loosely the same as that where we will go you don't to affect change on the global stage or in your nation or even in your community I believe eventually it's going to be the point where you, where you can do that within politics if you want. And I think that there'll be a time where we come back to that, where we have real demo democracy. It'll be a different style politics, which I'll, I'll get to my ideas in a minute, which are not meant to be the total solution, but just I've got some thoughts on it, um, on what sort of system we could have. But for that, that'll be down the track. I think in, the, in this in-between phase, there will be ways to, uh, to create this outside of the political system now but that's still this very there's a small percentage of the population that can understand that for now we're at the point where most people are just whatever they whatever sort of ideas they've got for what they'd like on society their minds are drawn back through the media and that's where i believe this personality this cult of personality gets us because the personality thing is like fires us up on a it's almost as if we know someone like trump or you know what I mean? And so what happens is then those people sort of draw us back on a level where we're almost giving our power to them and we're so angry at them. And it's like, but what is it? It's not like we know Trump that we can, if I'm so pissed off with him, if I knew him and he's my friend, I could grab him and shake him and say, or talk, I can't do anything with that. So my concern is I think this political thing suits the elites beautifully and that we don't actually have a way to create change but we're getting so emotional about the whole thing um, now people I understand the flip side of this is people will say well James come on <laughs> hey, don't you know the history of dictators don't you know um, don't you know about fascism don't you know about Hitler Stalin by the time they could say by the time you 
you know, hippies or whatever they want to, whatever they would call me, by the time you restructure this thing, it'll be too late. Well, what I'm saying is, I think the system is so engineered now, they know how to play us on every level, okay? We're, I believe we're a joke to the elites. It can be played, we can be played like fools, and we've seen that so many times. People celebrating, Obama gets in power, he's supposedly the guy who's going to do something for the public. Uh, Tony Blair, exact same thing in the UK. Absolute jokes, both of them. So we've seen this so many times that um, I believe it's engineered to such a level. If they want to bring in a, a, a fascist, uh, they're going to do that anyway. And hopefully this is not happening under Trump. I don't know. And I, and I will admit to being... I'm, on the, I'm still on the fence about some things about Trump. Um... But all I know is he's not for, he's definitely not for the common people and he's part of the establishment and he's not, he's not going to drain the swamp. He's, if anything, he's extending the swamp or he's letting it be. But um, I'm not, I'm not worried about breaking down his personality because I don't believe we can, we don't, we don't know him. Just like we just, just like celebrities can be under the spotlight. Even stuff now, a lot of stuff's coming up about Michael Jackson, okay? Look at Michael Jackson from his child, from about four or five years old, right through until he died. I think he was about 50 years old. Who could have been more under the spotlight? Who could have been in more examined, talked about? What do we actually know about these guys? So th the problem with the personality thing is if we didn't get into all that, then I don't believe we would be. I believe, I believe the personality just just like celebrities and like other public figures who that, that's what drives newspaper headlines but also if you keep stuff in the headlines and the headlines not just newspapers obviously but and not just television so much these days but social media it's always there boom if you had a boring guy um it's going to be hard to consistently someone like mitt romney or whoever it's going to be hard to consistently um inflame people where they start all debating it talking about it and if you particularly if you have a guy who's divisive as well where you know if the if the elites can put forward someone where they just know he's going to be gold you know he headline go headline gold um that's going to that's going to keep us constantly like let's face it so far I'm, i don't know about you guys but i'm sick of the death of hearing about trump and i was sick you know very early on this once he become president um and there's a lot going on in the world and there's a lot of important issues but he's dominating you see now that's all keeping us trapped in this you know this political framework but what is the i keep coming back to what is the damn point of it if we don't get any change, nothing, you know, you get vastly, supposedly vastly different parties in power. What is the difference in politics? Now, I'm not, am I denying that there aren't surface, there aren't small differences? No, I'm not, by the way. There are small differences. There could be higher tax onto one than the others. There could be a bit more spending. But when you start to understand how much wealth is available, okay, there's enough, put it this way, if right now, if someone, if I, if I was in a, um, a talk show or a, or a um, could be a podcast, could be a talk show, could be whatever, TV, radio, whatever, and I was sitting with politicians, I would never, I would walk out of the room, I would never begin to enter into any conversation that began with something like, well, we've got limited budgets, so therefore... We need to, you know, we can't spend so much on Medicare. I would never, ever even engage in something with, where that's the, that's the framework for the discussion because that is a lie. The truth is, and if anyone disagrees with this, you've got to either challenge them directly and, and call them liars or you've got to do more research. This is one thing, and I've said, I'm not being a know-it-all here because I've said elsewhere that there's many things that these are just my opinions and and don't just listen to me because you can get your the truth you, you can't get the truth from any one individual anyway and that i'm i'm confused about certain things as well i've admitted all that but this is one thing and this is a whole other podcast how i know this but i know with one million percent certainty that right now if we wanted to there is enough money for every person to be housed, have health care, 
everything on, on planet Earth, not just in the United States, not just in Western countries, on planet Earth. Okay, so we are choosing, and when I say we, I believe we're getting into the elitists who keep controlling all this. We are not, we do have a choice, and the choice is being made for us, and the choice is that they want to spend that on wars, they want to spend this on the keeping the banking sector as is, which, which controls our economies. They want to keep the, the resources, the wealth, and the power of the few, and they are choosing not to do these things, okay? So once you understand that, then it's like, well, do we, do we think that Obama didn't understand that? Do we think, so what are these people doing? They're playing a game for their own power. Um, so, and the, and the personality is what keeps drawing us back into all this. So, my ideas on, I believe a fairer political model will come in time, but one of the things that will need to be done is we need to reduce these bastards' power. And the bastards I'm talking about are even the presidents and all these leaders, politicians in general. They've got too much power. And it's not about getting the right person in because the problem, the other problem is here is we're sort of waiting for a saint to appear. Like, you know, most people have their, have their, um, their vices and their bad side. And as a, again, Trump's clearly got those, but we're naive if we think the, the previous people like Bill Clinton, and the, we're pretty naive to think, oh no, no, he was a lot better. Well, how do you know that? You don't know that. Um, and if he was, how much better? Was he five, was he 2% better than Trump? Is he a 5% better individual? Just because he says the right things in public doesn't mean some of these people knows how to play the game. No, I think Trump is, the difference is I think Trump, I believe 20 years ago, Trump would have been more, I believe he's, whatever we say about Donald Trump, I believe he's very, very smart when it comes to the media. He knows how to work the media. Uh, and I know of a number of celebrities, this is back in the, I know the people who were sort of getting famous in the 80s and that, where he actually told them very good advice on ha how to handle the media and that. And this included some sportsmen as well. And that tells me that, and it's stuff that actually, that when they got into tricky situations in their career, they said the right things and it really helped them or things they, they pulled down when there was a shitstorm brewing around something like an extramarital affair or whatever, uh, he was able to give them advice. Um, and he was kind of like a manager to some people. And uh, even Mike Tyson, in his, after his, he sort of resurrected his career post-boxing, people like that, um, he gives advice to a lot of people. So that tells me... He knows the media. This is a guy who's been sitting on the sidelines and there's interviews way back in the 70s or early 80s where he was saying he would like to run for president one day, but he don't didn't he didn't know if he would, but it, but he'd already put it out there. But why he kept waiting, waiting, waiting. And I believe if he'd ran in those earlier times, I think he's more than capable of saying most of the right things. I think he could have played that game like a Bill Clinton, but I think he's rec recognized the political climate where people are sort of sick of um, some of the political correctness, you know, things have gone and that uh, things always switch too far with all that politically correct stuff. I think things often switch back the other way. So political correctness was a, a lot of that stuff was kind of, you know, it, when, it, when I say political correct, correctness, like trying to control the language on what we can and cannot say, a lot of that was actually based, the foundations of that was real victims of these things coming together, approaching universities, which is where the, the place, if you get the academics on side, then eventually this stuff reaches public, um, the public in general. I think that, but you've got to remember that that was actually victims of racism, sexism, abuse, whatever, uh, minority groups who have been victimized in that. And so uh, the, the basis of that was good, but I think human nature is to, to generally swing from one extreme to the other. And so what's happened over time, in my opinion, is we have now gone so far that by the time Trump, Trump registered this 
in the years in the in the last years of Obama, Trump recognized there's particularly in the U.S. there's a real base that want to say whatever they want to say, and they don't want to be, t and they feel that um, things had gone a bit extreme. And I think I so I believe he's he might be exaggerating this the the asshole side of his personality. And don't get me wrong, he's an asshole, but I think he might be exaggerating that because he knows it's popular overall. And when I say popular, it's not. It's it might be that he's in states like California and New York. It's not that popular, obviously. But when you throw in the Bible Belt and the South and that, he he knew that he only needs, you know, just over fifty. I'm aware he didn't win the overall vote, but he's got a majority in certain areas. Um, and so I, I think this is a guy who'd sat, he'd been watching U.S. politics for about 50 years, and he'd worked out a plan, and he'd also read the political climate, and particularly Brexit and that. With what happened in Europe, UK and Europe, that opened, that made him go further into all that. So I think he's just, um, I think he's just uh, tapping into Unfortunately, there's a bit of a, there are elements of society that are still kind of unsavory and there are people who want to say either racist stuff or they want to say, they, they just want to say whatever they want. Um, but I think, that, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm annoyed at that and I'm also, I'm also aware that there is something beyond politics with all this where there are society changes uh, beyond just voting and what politicians, the changes they make, he's actually setting a bad tone where this could go further and further. Don't get me wrong, I'm annoyed on that level, but this discussion, if you ask me for, to bring up those issues, you know, like, where is this going to go? Is this going to, are children now going to see, well, if the president can say that, I can say that. That's a separate discussion and I'm annoyed with that too. And I think that's, but that, but that equally that could be held, that's really because Trump is famous, I would argue. And so, meaning a pre any president is famous, okay? So I would argue the same thing if you had a um, celebrity saying the same sort of stuff, and you do get that, then they've got a responsibility too, and that's a whole separate discussion to this. And I understand why people are angry on that, but I think that's a side issue and a less important issue to the, the thought about the whole political system, whether it's rigged, because with, if it's rigged, the only point in trying to challenge someone like Trump now, um, and or in other countries trying to get in fairer people, trying to get in people who, re, um, pretty much, or, what would you say, just ordinary people who represent the common people, right? That's that's the most important issue, and so I think we can we're in danger here. I mean, there's a long time. There's many people saying that Trump will get a next, you know, next term as well. So, if he serves eight years, I don't know what's that. We've got five and a half or six years left. Do people really want to be giving their power away and so angry when the when let's face it, it's a helpless situation if you remain in that political, um, in sort of mindset really it's a mindset where you choose to there are people because because here's the alternative there are people who go around and that's getting back to what i brought up in the in this podcast at the start there are people going around who are they don't i i, I talk to people all the time they're just not you bring up the stuff oh yeah trump's in power or oh yeah theresa may's in power in the uk um or whoever the local leader is in in countries like australia new zealand wherever um, there's people who, you know, they just, they're just going about creating change on an individual level or they might, or in their neighborhood or in their thing. And, and I look at these people and I often think, hang on, a lot of them who are not caught up in all this, the political mindset seem to create change better, I believe. Now there's that saying by Desmond Tutu, and he said this during in a much more hopeless situation than we're in now politically during apartheid he said do your little so he was a black um christian leader but he was trying to help the people rise up but he also said and he and he was you know that's those sort of things like nazi germany and um apartheid and things like that 
those are potentially times where it, uh, I don't know. It could be worth becoming political. But what I'm saying is, he was basically a um, social justice campaigner, but he also said, "Do your little bits of good wherever you are in the world, for it's those little bits of good, when added up, that overwhelm society." Now, the issue I've got there is, how can people do their little bits of good when they're so um, not just uh, like they're lashing like I'm if I view America from afar now a lot of Americans and I'm seeing this in other countries too but they're becoming very divided and does it make sense at the moment where you have let's say uh, there's something like a 330 million in the US so let's say you've got 165 million versus the other 165 million at each other's throats over let's face it Whoever gets in power, there's no better change for for these for these people. Now I'm aware. Don't get me wrong. I'm aware of things like this immigration thing, splitting up families, all that. I'm aware of that. But it always seems you always get something else under the next president. It's never you never get to that promised land. The grass is always greener until you get that guy. So I'm not getting. I'm refusing to get into those little issues because what I'm trying to do is, if you keep a helicopter view. What if everyone just said we need this system is not fair for us anymore? Do we have the power to restructure it? Now I'll give you an example. What's happening? And unfortunately, the U.S. can't do this under its constitution without a constitutional change. But one small example. I'm not. I'm not saying this is the total system. But one small example is what's becoming more common in other parts of the world is referendums. Now that can I believe that's not a that's not a total solution or a perfect solution. I think some would argue what happened with Brexit was a, ref, you know, that's, it's dubious whether that's for the, for the best. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to get into that, but I'm just saying it's not a perfect solution, but I also think it's a way, there has been another number of other cases where the people have gotten what they wanted. Now the Swiss system is getting to the point where they can call a referendum quite easily. Other countries, they've got to have something like about, it's something like 10% of the population have to sign, five or 10% of the population, which is a lot, have to sign a petition. That's a hell of a lot. But under the Swiss model, they can call a referendum on many different subjects. Now, I'll give you an example where I think this could have worked is under Tony Blair, going to the Iraq war was enormously pop unpopular with the British people. They didn't want to go. But he sided with Bush, um, and from then on, Britain was sort of America's puppy dog on, on many of these wars. They sided with Bush, and that was enormously important, not just for... Uh, that, was a, that was important for the Iraq war beyond Britain, because um, Bush was going against the UN, if I call, recall correctly, and Tony Blair, and he, and he didn't have any other support because there was no proof of weapons destruction. And as you know now, most historians and political commentators say they were, that's either made up or at the very least there, were, there still was never any definitive proof. But they wanted to go to Iraq. They were hell-bent on it. And so Tony Blair got behind it. Now, and the British people didn't want this. Now, here's an example. Now, with referendums slowly becoming easier, that there's no way that they would have won a referendum. And so they, there are ways in countries, many countries now, to override politicians. And I would argue, for an apolitical person like myself, um, uh, there's an example where I'm operating outside, kind of inside, but basically outside the political system because I could just say, well, I don't give, I don't care about politicians, but I care about this issue. I'm going to go down there and cast my vote in the referendum, but I'm doing it because of my, I have democratic power, but I don't get engaged in the whole political process because you guys aren't as important anymore because we we the people can override you now if the, now this is again I'm not this is simplistic this is sounding simplistic because I'm just talking about one thing I think it could take a hundred things like referendums but I do think gradually and I think the Swiss model is worth studying and there are other countries that are starting to do this more and more I do believe that there will be ways where we can gradually 
move politicians down to something like administrators. And I think we should even remove their t fancy titles or something where they don't get, they don't, they can't go around saying I'm the leader of the free world and all this jazz. And don't get me wrong, there will be certain things where we the people, there might be reasons why we couldn't call a referendum on certain things. There might be limits to that. And that's why I say there might be many things. But I do believe under that sort of model, if we could have, let's let's take Britain, for example, with Tony Blair, if we could have stopped stopping Britain going, if, if the British people could have stopped Britain going to the Iraq war, the Iraq war may not have happened. Um, we could have saved millions of lives there. We could have said, what, what could we have spent that money else? Uh, what could we have spent that money on instead? So that's an example there where suddenly Tony Blair, the prime, the prime minister of Great Britain, wouldn't have been as important. And, and apolitical people can actually get involved and enforce change without worrying about that because politicians aren't. And I believe that's going to be that's going to be one of the ways that we restructure this whole system. OK, now there is talk that th there needs to be. I believe the U.S. Constitution was the most amazing um, document for any founding nation and I think but I think there's no way the founding fathers could have covered everything and when people talk about the constitution like it's a um, like religious fundamentalists talk about scriptures as if you have no right to even question anything of that that is bullshit okay we need to call a spade a spade there's some things where you could adjust that keep it all intact you, you might be able to keep 99.9% .9 of that intact but, and I don't know enough about the gun thing, I'm not getting into that, but whether that's an example of another, I'm not sure. But there are certain things where American people have to stand up and say, we can question, um, just like even, you know, you know, a lot of Americans are Christian, right? So even the Bible has been um, adjusted for language and different things, and, and has it hasn't always been exactly as it is. So, you know, the Constitution... Um, and, and don't get me wrong, do I think it should be done very carefully and, and no hasty decisions? Yes, because I think it's such an amazing document. And I think up until about just after, up until about the 1950s, I think many of much of the world was following America because of the constitutional model. Much of the world was following America and trying to create cop, copy American freedoms. And so I'm not naive on that, but I also think with something like ref the fact that you guys can't have referendums um that is a big down that's a big downside of the u.s political system right there um another one is besides the referendum idea i think if you take the u.s again i think not most other countries have multiple parties and major th not just not just a third party i'm talking fourth fifth sixth and there needs to be a system where you can form coalition governments so um let's say the republicans and the democrats remain the top two but if many voters feel well the problem is you only need to get those two leaders in the same room or on the same page with corporations and that with elitists and they're basically the same party on many issues particularly especially war but also banking uh you know so and, and also challenging the corporatocracy which is instead of democracy it's corporations running you know the the sham of democracy i would say um so if they're not doing that then you may not be able to get one third party that challenges the same as that, that can reach the same sort of figures that those two, maybe not anytime soon. But in other countries, what you can do is you can form a coalition of my uh, two or three parties, and then they can usurp the big major parties because they join, join together, you could get over 50% that way. Um, but these are just, again, this is me walking around, walking around a park here in Sydney off the top of my head, and I'm not... I'm not, I'm the last person that could, could devise ideas, okay? But I'm just giving random examples to say these are one of a million ideas that we could come up with to enforce change on politicians and also downgrade their power. They've got too much power right now. But beyond that, that's restructuring the political model and I think, I think that'll happen in time. I think it already is. Um, but I also feel that 
there will be ways, and again, I'm not... I'm not going to feel embarrassed that I haven't formulated a structure here for how this should be done because I'm not – this will take infinitely brighter minds than me and many, many people to figure this out. But there will be ways to eat totally separate from politics that we can create change. Now, someone said to me, what about the ideas of charities? Could we give – could we get, um, and maybe this can be done like in an open source way where we see everything that charities do, certain charities that could come along, and can we, if these were, if we gave to the right ones, could these become models where they could enforce change? Can things be done totally separate to politics? So again, the things like referendum and uh, um, downgrading, downgrading, politicians power in general taking away their titles all those things and turning them more into lowly paid administrators instead um similar to that uh or or the opposite of that would be just working totally separate to that so could we the, you know the charity is one idea but could we, are there other ways not for example could we use social media somehow? Um, even even that idea, like referendums, is a tricky one because a lot of people are just too busy on certain issues. A lot of people are just too busy, or they don't care enough. Like they care enough to vote once every four years or three years or whatever in each country, but are they going to get out and actually vote? So another idea I've heard is that could we use social media? And if there was a way to do it in an ironclad way where it can't be rigged with accounts and all that, maybe you get a specific ID or something. Could we use social media to have votes all the time? I mean, people do this. You see all these surveys and you see this is just like a random survey on someone's Facebook page or where, or on Twitter or wherever. And you see they've, they've cast 10,000 votes. Would there be ways to for the people to be heard beyond? Because what we've really got now is... You know, once it, it might only be if it's once every four years, it might only be 15 times in a person's life that they actually get a say. So this idea that we get a say, is that good enough in the modern world? Is it good enough to say, OK, 15 times in my life I get a say <laughs> and, and half that time I don't even know who I'm voting for or half the time there was, as a lot of people said with the last US election, there was no one you know, Trump versus Hillary. So my whole say comes down to these two meatheads, you know, <laughs> Trump versus Hillary. Of all, out of 330 million people, Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton. That, and that's my say. So is that is that really the Greek ideal of democracy? Come on. So would there be ways where we could, with modern technology and that, would there be ways where we could have a say every week? If we want to um, and so and and could that be done both within the political system where where we're doing stuff that enforces politics on the people who were formerly called politicians we now call administrators who carry out our will or could that I believe it could also be done separate to that where we have a say and then maybe groups that and again I'm not embarrassed that I haven't got this figured out because this is a hell of a I, I, I haven't even got the beginning scratch the surface and I don't believe I'm the person who could remotely do this but I'm just giving examples where I believe in the future we will um, there will be ways that we could have say and have sort of elections but are not political elections do you know what I mean and we could have votes on stuff and there'll be ways to enforce that and I don't know what they are but I've just got a gut feeling there is definitely a way to do this and this is the stuff, and I, and I believe people, even when they set up um, charities or ventures, or they just, sometimes there's ways just to put out ideas, and if everyone starts doing certain things, then you've created change, but it's outside that model. And so I'll go back to what I said at the start of this whole thing, that my concern is that if you look at the ways individuals, when they're all added up, the sort of things we can do on the planet, my entire concern with all the anger, resentment, emo you know, helplessness that people feel with politics is that it's making us feel so small, right, that we don't actually look around and say, well, 
does that mean we're doomed if Donald Trump brings in these bullshit policies? Does that mean does that mean my only choice is to wait for or if he's in power, you know? Two, does, it, does that mean in two years I've got to wait at least and I can do nothing in two years? Or if he's in power again, like they're saying, then six years, does that mean I can just, you know, I'm just helpless and, and all I'm going to be is an emotional basket case ranting and raving <laughs> all, over the, all over social media or all over the planet for that period? Or, should, or is there a way we can just turn away from that now another idea i heard is that see if we turn away I, I just wonder what will happen to the political framework if people gave it no time whatsoever like for going back to the analogy of organized religions in younger people are sliding it's despite what they tell us the the real statistics are that there's less and less people in churches there's less and less people converting to religions and it's all it's all it's all broken apart where now people will either be different denominations or they will be their own religion or they will be where where the um where the religious institutions trick people is they take a report if you ask are you a christian well a lot of people in america for example would write that but the point is are they practicing are they really that and for every person i know who's a, who says they're a committed christian and they really go to church all the time a lot of other people they're just born to that it's more like a cultural thing you can see that especially in judaism where a lot of modern jews are really um what you call cultural Jews. They're not actually religious anymore. Um, but they still carry that heritage. They might do the religious holidays, things like that. Uh, and so I just wonder whether we can affect all these changes uh, in multiple ways is what I am guess I'm saying. There's, there's got to be a way where we can do all this, and 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 the problem is, how are we going to think all this when we, when we're constantly tuned into that? So that so that's my idea about what would happen if we turned away from this, just like the just like that organized religion example I was giving, and if we if we turn away, does that take the power away from politicians? For example, we're sort of giving Trump as that, and anything he says is headline news. Does that give him greater power? I would say, yeah, shit, yeah, it does. So, what if we just say you are in a not just you, but all recent presidents, and until someone comes along, you are irrelevant people. You do not represent us, okay? And then if so, we're not going to give you any attention anymore. So, what I've heard in some countries now, I've got to check this. I've got to check this again. This is. I'm not in my office. I'm out in the park. I, I don't remember. I'm just going by memory here, but I'm pretty sure in some countries you actually need 25% of people to vote. Now, I believe the anger we're seeing so far is just the tip of the iceberg. People are going to get so pissed off in the coming years, coming decades, whatever, however long it takes for us to finally say this, this whole system sucks, right? But people are going to get so angry that I believe it's possible that a lot of people will just say, I'm not voting, I'm not voting under those circumstances. Even in countries like here in Australia, if you don't vote, you actually get a fine, okay? But in the US and some other countries, it's not compulsory to vote. But even, I believe even, even here in Australia, some people will start taking that fine out of, so I believe we could boycott elections. Now, again, this is off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure in the UK, it's something like you need 23% of people to actually turn out for it to be an election. So what if, now, now I don't know what the percentage is in the US, but, and maybe there is no percentage, but if I'm right, just, just to take this as an example, okay, in the last election with Hillary and um, Trump, if the US, or if that's not true, then another country has this minimum rate, what if we all got together and said, these people are such despicable people who have no track record of ever saying anything for the common people, and Donald Trump's definitely in that category, and Hillary Clinton is, then why couldn't we say, I deem this to be so useless, I'm not going to vote. Can we all get together and actually say, 
make these elections void where we just now now again i don't i can't remember if the us is in that category but definitely some countries have a minimum you have to get hit a minimum level now i don't believe the public are aware enough just yet to understand what's the tricks that are really if we really knew how much wealth exists right and that that us having things like universal health care free education these aren't socialist things these are literally pennies just just small chump change to these people right okay and and to the countries themselves when you really start getting into the secret gold treaties the the real wealth that exists in the world okay that's what i'd recommend start looking up secret gold treaties um when you get into all that and you see the real wealth that exists we've all been lied to there's about a million times more wealth than we believe budget the budgets that they set are a joke they're just tiny change and you see that by good examples are we never have enough money for no no we don't have enough for healthcare. we've got to you know we've got to move move some here to education blah 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 then there's a war oh hang on here's a trillion dollars well oh under obama the banks are in trouble the private banks are in trouble nothing to do with the people the private banks are in trouble okay here's a trillion dollars where did that come from no one says excuse me um we were we were asking for 10 million dollars for the state of california so orphans could be looked after you you told us we don't have enough than the budget um just a small question where did that trillion dollars come from for that war where did that you know it's like so when people start understanding that and i believe this is all gonna it's already starting to come out but it's going to reach a threshold we're not going to fall for this stuff anymore and we're going to realize okay and, and as i've admitted maybe trump maybe trump is the is going to go down as the worst president ever i've got no idea as i said i'm confused i'm not pretending to have a total bird's eye view total um bird's eye view understanding of this whole thing i'm confused by trump sometimes i don't like him as an individual i don't like a lot of his policies i don't like what he says i don't know how bad when we when we when the sh it's often with politics though it's years or decades after or even sometimes a century after that you that sometimes heroes are revealed to be scumbags and so what i'm saying is trump is obviously a scumbag but how he compares to the others we'll have to sort of let history play out and and the and historians gather new details about it just like with so some celebrities stuff comes out so much later that and i just keep bringing up celebrities because they are also under the microscope but it's also very hard to work out what they stood for we don't we don't know so and the other factor is this is the key thing i believe is that we go back to the special interest groups right um what we've got to and when i say special interest that's more than just people lobbying governments it's getting into more the ideas also of elite power groups they could be foreign or national secret societies to all these different really you're talking the affiliations that u.s presidents have british prime ministers have too these people don't just come they're not some person like i gather most of my listeners will be here and myself who just we have no affiliations if you if you or i wanted to enter politics now we'd just say we'd be doing it because we go well i want to help the people i believe i can affect change these people never come from those sort of backgrounds so they have so many affiliations that well another thing we've got is sort of and this is my problem with the cult of personalities we should be studying administrations but what we're doing is we're the because these big personalities keep coming in like if we take say george w bush like trump and that they keep us focused on just them but when they get into power do we really believe that they're just allowed to do anything and and another thought that we've got to factor in with all this is um or an interrelated thought is that we don't know whether they're being pressured sometimes we don't know whether they're out of their depth a lot and i believe donald trump would be out of his depth a lot on this sort of stuff um and this idea that he just does whatever he wants i don't believe that's again when you factor in about a quadrillion dollars each political term <laughs> you know 
you know, you've seen, you've all seen how corporations act when there's only a million dollars at stake, when there's ten million dollars. You, you know, we can't conceive of a trillion dollars, let alone a quadrillion. What does that look like? Well, how much money? How many? How many elitist families? You know, families that go back, old bloodlines that go back, that are worth trillions of dollars in their own right. How many corporations that are involved? How many? Do, do they just allow some guy to come in and say, right? I want, what's what does this button do? Boom. No. So. I think this is all sort of, and I believe Donald Trump, someone like Trump likes to portray himself as the only decision maker and he's not listening to anyone and all this stuff. I think that sort of model where a dictator can rise in the West um, like a Hitler, I believe is a bit naive. I think we've got to be more on guard against, I, don't get me wrong, I think he'd love to portray himself as that, but I believe what we should be looking for more is power groups, power players, plural, plural rather than singular. And I think a good example of this was, no one really knew this at the time, but George Bush Sr. was in power 88 to 92, or Clinton came in power early 92. So four years technically, but most political analysts now believe when all, all the truths come out, all the biographies, all the reports of White House interns and all that between 80 and 88, George Bush Sr. was basically president most of that time. Now that's just, you know, because not only Reagan, he, um, you know, he's well known that he used to sleep a lot of the day, particularly later in his term. He was sick for a period there. Um, very sick, very, very um, losing his faculties to a degree. Uh, and it's now we realize when the truth comes out that, yeah, a vice president now th could actually run things. Now, that's not that's not in most people's minds now where we look at that. We don't even factor something like that in. But a vice president, of course, is just one example of all the people who could be involved. So and there are actually things in the U.S. Constitution to um, make sure that one person, th there are things in place to stop a dictator coming in. And there are, um, there are laws that are, that block the president having too much power. But beyond that, the, I believe that's nothing compared to the amount of, of secret affiliations that these people have, whether it's military, business, whatever, secret societies, all that stuff. When you add all that up together, then to believe that this this guy's just doing all this on his own is naivety, and I think that's. But I, but I believe that that serves them. If they can keep us focused on just one personality, we'll never see who the true power players are. Um, and so. And I don't believe, by the way, just because the media and some of the elite clearly wanted Hillary. Don't get me wrong, they did. I don't believe that it was a victory for the for the common people because you see that all the time in elections what people don't understand with the elite it is, is it's not a united force it's it's divided too like the common people but it's but it's got but it's got they've all these groups are vying for power within the elite okay and or within the shadow government let's say but the point is they've all got a common um They've all got a common bond and that they do not represent the common people. So that's all we need to care about. But I've never believed this idea that the elite are just one group who meet up and they just like the Bilderberg group. I believe that they, all these groups have influence, but they are, there are power players within them. But I believe clearly Donald Trump is the, I'll give you an example how these, it's the antithesis of someone like JFK. JFK was against the CIA, he even said, I'm going to, sh just before he died, he said, I'm going to splinter it, the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the four winds. And he said, we've got too much invested in military too. Now, Donald Trump said that he, um, he said certain things about how he's for the CIA. They do a lot of good work. And he also said, more importantly, that the, the U.S. military, this is the military that's basically Rome times 50 in our modern world. It's got bases in every country. It's got the, the, the spending on the U.S. military from, the, from each annual U.S. budget is off the scale. And so many things could be spent instead of that, but they keep amping that up. Donald Trump said, we 
are woefully underfunded. Our military is underfunded. <laughs> so do you think these, think of all these corporations like um, Raytheon and huge military contractors like um, Lockheed and that, all these corporations, do you think they would be going, oh, no, we don't want Trump in power? He's saying, oh, hang on, what? No, no, he said, oh, he's going to give us more funding. <laughs> you know, so clearly he, he said certain things that – Certain groups of the elitists, and maybe not all of them, because Clinton, Clinton had a lot of fans, but certain people definitely would have wanted him. He said nothing. If I was there or other, any other people with a heart, that's the thing we're lacking. We're not lacking intelligence with these – maybe Trump, maybe maybe Bush, maybe. But overall, we've had plenty of intelligent leaders. But we need someone with a heart, and anyone with a heart would, would not be saying these sort of things. They'd be saying, okay, the common people – need help to rise up the common people have never have arguably never been in a worse state okay but he didn't say any of those things it wasn't about that he said surface things like let's make america great again and all that stuff and i'm am i am i saying that any of these people are uh have no redeeming qualities no i don't i think they all they all also have a um that's what's confusing to some people is i think they do have a they do have moments where they display some sort of humanity, um, but it's it's always overridden by the fact that they won't stand up for the people on these things. And what it would require is someone brave enough to actually say there's a lot more money in these countries than we've told the public. Now, what's going to happen to the banking system? What's going to, you know, for example, if there is a lot more gold, and that's gold's an issue I'd advise people to look into. Once you start to see that, what that would mean is if someone said, look, if a US president said, okay, there's actually 100 times more gold in the world than we've told you, um, then the price of gold would go down. It's supply and demand thing, right? The price of gold would become not worthless, but very, very cheap. So it's the same model as if for any of you have seen the movie, The Blood Diamond, the exact same model as that where what, what co co diamond corporations like De Beers do is they control the actual supply and they have huge factories where they're storing all these diamonds, but they're not recording them or releasing them on the market to drive up the price. So it's creating what I call the illusion of scarcity. And, there's, and, and so we've got that with gold. We've also got that with money. Where we're being told no there's not enough money around <laughs> okay but then these as i as i was saying before these trillion dollar amounts just keep appearing out of nowhere oh we found this blah, blah blah you know it's never um for example if you research into the day before 9 11 donald rumsfeld said now let me remember the exact figure i'm pretty sure it's 7.2 I think it's at least a couple of trillion dollars, put it that way, was missing from the Pentagon's military budget. Missing. Just got, and that was all, and that was the day before 9 11, and that was all lost in the rush. And you often see black budgets, and um, if you look up, if you Google news stories about um, missing amounts from military budgets and this ties into black budgets you see because they're funneling money in all directions uh, you'll see that this happens all the time and these amounts add up to amounts that would cover all of our social welfare needs all of our spending on the poor all of the things that can protect the common people but not just not just left-wing socialist stuff also right-wing stuff for example if you you know the right is always about and i and i like this sort of side of right-wing politics it's about um helping people become entrepreneurs as well so if you want to start businesses you could get a tax break or you could get a um, a loan from the government or things like that. Those are actually right-wing measures because they want people to become more entrepreneurial on the on the right. You see, so all this could open up if if we knew what the real amounts were. But it would take someone that brave to actually what you're doing by those sort of things. And I and I believe the only person I can think of post World War Two is JFK. 
is he was beginning to actually challenge the whole foundations of this thing and say, we've been lied to about many, many things. And that gets into not only someone with bravery, but someone who's actually able to communicate all this to the public. But to do it honestly, I think you'd have to do it before you got into power too. You'd have to stand for this sort of stuff. And they just wouldn't let you anywhere near... Um, I, I don't believe anyway that under the current political system they're going to let you anywhere near the... Um, the you, you might be able to run for office, but when it comes down a little bit like what happened to Bernie Sanders, who again, I'm not saying I necessarily support him or anything like that, but... He did win the Democratic nomination and then Hillary did some tricky maneuver with the superdelegates. Uh, and the, the same thing happened last time with, before that, with the Republicans when Obama was in power. Ron Paul was saying a lot of things that, you know, challenging. He was bringing up these things about money and stuff with the Federal Reserve. That this, For example, he was saying that the Federal Reserve has never been properly audited in all its um, 100 plus year existence and that it's he was bringing up things that the public don't know which is which is underground knowledge but it's not known to the masses that the federal reserve although it's got federal on the title anyone can look this up it's a privately owned organization and yet they're setting the currency of the u.s and jfk challenged this for example he shortly before he died he set up something called united states currency notes because he was not only against the cia he was against the federal reserve and for americans you can occasionally see this on your <clears throat> on your current uh, note currency you'll occasionally see a united states note as opposed to 99.9 .9 percent of them uh, Federal Reserve notes. See, so the United States notes were um, the United States notes were only released into circulation under JFK for a short period. It might have been something like September 1963 to November when he died. Or a very short period. And so he was. What it would take is someone to actually challenge the foundations of the monetary system the political system challenge all the big what are, what are all these corporations doing involved in our politics why is the military having so much say you know it's commonly known that for example the you can't become president on an anti-war platform and i believe we've seen that with with the likes of ron paul and uh bernie sanders in particular who was a lot more popular where they'll just find a way that the military is so and, and that goes back to special interests the military is one of those so and and president eisenhower in his farewell speech 1961 before kennedy said he he was the only general i believe at least in recent times to become a u.s president and his farewell speech was a huge warning about the military industrial complex is too powerful and this is going so that's going back over a century ago warning that exactly the situation we're in now that we're going to be in a basically a militarized government um and that military is going to dominate politics so it would I anyone who's listened to this and going, James, you're not list, you're not you're not aware of what Trump's doing, man. I'm aware of all that stuff, and I am angry too, to a degree, but I believe it pales in in comparison to these bigger issues. And if we sort out these bigger issues and actually bring to light, okay, what what do we really have? Why are our budgets at X amount? I don't care what the amount is. If it's 1.1 trillion in one country, or if it's 10 trillion in another country, or if it's 4 billion in another, whatever that budget is, we need to say, is that all there is? Okay. And we need to actually start, well, well, how come you're able to get this for that? How come you're able to bail out private banks? How come you're able to go to these wars? What is the real figure? And, the, and, and we need to keep digging, digging. Okay, so hang on. Why did we have billions missing from one budget? Why did this money go missing? How come you got these black budgets, all this? But this would upset. The problem is <laughs> you're moving in, maybe as a political leader, you're moving into assassination territory here, or at the very least, you're going to get character assassinated to the point where they can use the media to such an extent where no one will vote for you because they'll dig up all your dirt. And like I said, almost everyone has dirt. So they can always find something. And why is it some leaders we 
we um, receive so much dirt about them and others we don't receive much why is that so why do we learn so much bad stuff about some and not others um, and that does I will admit it gets the one point and I am still I don't like Trump as a person but I am co still confused what he stands for is the one thing that is interesting is he definitely has a lot of enemies still in the media not just not just on the left actually even w w definitely within the right too um, and so I won't pretend to know to be I, I, I think he's a f strange character uh, I don't know, but all I would say is he's he is a figure who how can I put it he definitely he definitely doesn't exhibit any signs that he's for the common people. He's just got elitist rhythm all over and I think this is what people missed is that elitist doesn't have to be a track record of being in politics. It's more, see, Rupert Murdoch is one of the ultimate elitists. He could go into power now and he, he could say the same sort of line as um, when he's running for a political office. I don't even know what country he's a citizen on. I mean, I know originally he was Australian, but he might be British now. But when he was running, when he would run for, if he would run for political office, he could say the same sort of thing that Trump said, well, I'm not the establishment, I'm outside the political establishment, but but he's definitely, the, this is a guy who's influenced politics through the media and done all sorts of dirty stuff for, for decades, he's definitely elitist, and so Trump always had that, and all our other leaders, if you go back, see, for example, um, Ralph Nader, who was saying a lot of this sort of stuff and I think he I, I believe Ralph Nader is an interesting um, Democrat and and he's now he's now either, he may even be dead I can't remember but he's very old and he's too old to run but he ran and he became a bit of a laughing stock in US politics he used to run each election for years or decades and he was often saying things like these these sorts of things like this system, you know, you would run it as an, I think sometimes Democrat, but sometimes independent, but he would be saying, look, I'm not going to take these affiliations. I'm, I'm not going to take these, there's too many corporate interests, all these things. But I just think Ralph Nader, if he came along in the 2020s, a figure like that, and there will be many, many others, but I'm saying someone like that is the sort of person we need to know. What was interesting is while everyone on the left at least and many people in the international media were totally falling over themselves over Obama when he got voted in, I remember Ralph Nader was, um, he was interviewed on TV and, and at the time Ralph was a Democrat and so he was a colleague of Obama's while Obama had been, don't quote, quote me on this, congressman or senator on his way, on his way before president. And I know he was something in the state of Illinois, but uh, Ralph Nader said, he, and, he, and this wasn't popular at the time, but he said, well, look at Obama. He has no track record of voting against these corporate interests or these military interests. For example, and he gave certain things where um, certain wars, certain, when it came down to voting, he was just a yes man for his party. Uh, when it came to standing up against big pharma corporations, he just voted the way his party wanted him to, and that's not the that's not the sort of so he saw through the charade of the personality to actually say what are the policies, where is the signs that this guy is any different, what has he done, and he said it's and he laid out what R Ralph Nader said he'd taken tremendous heat from his party, or from the even the peoples he represented because often he would be going against his own party and voting to say no this is not right we shouldn't go to this war no we we shouldn't allow big pharma corporations to have these rules this is wrong blah, blah. and he would but you do it because it's right for the people and it doesn't matter what's right for your special interests or what's right for your party you should be prepared to vote against your own party and people like Ralph Nader and, and the Kennedys had that sort of um, whatever faults they have as individuals, and I'm sure they have many, but like I say, 
there's something in certain individuals where if you put a gun to their head, and I'm sure Ke both Kennedys knew that they basically were putting a gun to their head, they just, although they, I'm sure they want to, they would have a greedy side. I think it, there's enough in the Kennedys' background to show they did on some levels, but somehow when it came against voting against their own people, uh, doing something that would not help the common people, they just couldn't do it. And they would rather put that gun to their head, even though they probably were, a part of them inside themselves was screaming. And, you know, but when, now we don't have that people like that around. And I also think now that the Kennedys wouldn't be let anywhere near power in the first place. I think that was the last, something like, something changed about, say, the 70s or mid 60s, whenever. Um, and I don't even think they need to assassinate anymore. There's many, many ways they can do it and just make sure that these people don't get near. And and that's what Jesse Ventura believes, why he was investigated and interviewed by the CIA was that, and it wasn't done in a heavy way. They just said, we want to talk with you. And his first question was, I thought you guys aren't allowed to operate on US soil because they were having a meeting with them um, in his state outside of Langley, Virginia. There they were, a whole lot of them. And they're asked, so they're not really allowed to do this sort of stuff, but they were trying to work out and I, you know, how he got into power with none of these affiliations. And it's the only one where they, it's the only um, governor of a state where they've actually, where someone has pulled this off, just running independent in the true sense of the word. Okay. And, and he believes, and I believe too, that they were interviewing to figure out, <laughs> to make sure that never happens again. I mean, it's hard to believe that the CIA were interviewing him to figure out, well, how can we do, make this work again so that the people get their say? No, they were making sure that their interest, intelligence and military interests would always be looked after, and that's by keeping the people out of it. Um, so that's the sort of, that people like that, um, I don't believe they can, they can, they can maybe, maybe someone could pull off a miracle and do what Ventura did again, but more likely even at the state level, that's not going to be possible again. Uh, and certainly I don't believe that at the presidential level and the amount of money it takes that they have to raise to do that. Now, maybe I'm wrong, maybe with social media and someone who can work the internet for people, but then you've got corporations like Google on that, that there's reports came out that said Google can sway an election by as much as five to ten percent by deciding which stories become headlines. You know, because you know how they sort of when you type in, let's say, if, let's say if going back to 2000 and let me think what it was, 12, I believe, I think it was a 2012 election. Let's say Mitt Romney. I'm just plucking someone out of thin air. When he was running for office. Um, if you typed in his name, some news stories show up before others, right? And there's no, we don't know why that is. Google supposedly has an algorithm, but they can, they can sway elections by five to 10%. And Google's just one, like Facebook, Twitter, all these others. And these corporate, these corporations, if you follow them, they've all got people that are either elitists or in bed with the elite. In that they're going to all their groups like Bilderberg, like they're all they're all in bed. Whereas someone like myself and hopefully you guys, if any of us were were in the situation where we are sort of being courted by these people, I hope that we would tell them to fuck off because because um, we would just say no. We I don't want to. I don't want any of this. I'm for, whereas these a lot of these Silicon Valley types, if you actually follow through, they're going to all these elitist type of meetings. There. So even and even if they're by the way, even if they're there's arguments that those sort of meetings like the Bilderberg Group and that are nothing. And I'm open to that. They they may well be just think tanks, blah blah blah. But the point is, you've got them mixing with all these same elitists. Um, and that. It can rub off on them. It's not. It's not always like a. I think the way these elitists court you is not like. Will you sign us? Will you sell your soul to the devil? No. It's more. It just happens subtly, and before you know it, you've been influenced by these people. But at the very least, you shouldn't be even be rubbing shoulders with them if you represent the common people, or even if you're just a humanitarian, is a better way of saying it. Um, you should never be siding with tiny groups when you've got something like 8 billion people on the planet, that's your, that's who you represent. 
as a not just a politician, but as a um, as a human being, as someone with a heart, that's who you represent. And so, someone who's totally independent of all that, I don't believe they can get any, anywhere near. So, going back to my original assessment of the the political world we're in now, uh, my thinking is. You're better off, if you're going to get caught up in this political stuff, I think you've got to keep your head above water and not get sucked into it where it almost becomes like mind control where some news story comes news story comes out. And I, and, I, and am I, so, by the way, am I saying that we shouldn't, when Donald Trump wants to split up um, families with immigration, those immigration border control policies and that, and Ill illegal immigrants and so on. Am I saying that we shouldn't protest that? We shouldn't speak? We should? No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying we've got to keep our priorities on if that sort of stuff, because it's almost like group, leaders like that, and let's not pick on Trump, like there's Theresa May in the UK, there's Angela Merkel in Germany, there's Putin in Russia, there's many things going on, okay? When all these leaders make these sort of ghastly things, and they always do, whether it's Obama letting us down and saying, oh, I'm going in to invade Libya. Well, why? What You were anti-war. What's this about? Right? That's When they do stuff like that, it's, it's just, it's almost like we're guaranteed, well, then we've got to go through this reactionary process. But at the end of the day, they've done the decision. What are we going to... Now, I'm not, I'm not denying if approval ratings get to an all-time low, if people... Presidents can react to that. But what all I'm saying is it's sad that our only tiny voice, apart from that little vote every four years, and the fact that we don't often have a vote, really, because is there, is there any choice anyway? If they're all elitist and there's, you know, there's slightly different policies, you know, do we even have a voice? But what I'm saying is, if our only voice beyond that is, is a, you know, is occasionally being able to get through because everyone disagrees with the policy. I will admit, sometimes politicians, if it's if it's proven to be highly, um, if it pisses off most of the public, they will be open occasionally to changing their mind. I'm, so I'm not saying that we should. I'm not saying apolitical means don't voice your concerns, but to go beyond that and get caught up in this whole left-right paradigm and to hate 50% of your um, fellow countrymen because of marginal differences with uh, marginal differences in policy with essentially what are two two parties on the same, you know, two sides of the same coin is just, I think they've, the elitists have kind of won them because they've divided and conquered us. And that's where I have a whole issue with all this. I'm not sure whether, I'm not sure whether getting involved in all that and giving away our power and feeling helpless is the way to go. So that's, that's my best summary of this whole situation and why we should be looking for other ways at this and those of you who want to I would advise those of you if you want to keep political then do that but if you start feeling hopeless then know that you know don't give up because I think the world is changing in many ways and and I think you know obviously many people have said that before and we thought we would have had if you go back to the 1960s generation we we thought we would have had something like a utopia by now but I think the difference this time is with technology particularly the internet and particularly the way sites like YouTube for example we've never had a period in history where you could literally if you in previous eras, if you didn't know any, if you if you knew something really really important, you can't broadcast that to people. You've got to go. Through, you'd have to you'd have to contact the mainstream media and ask, can you go on TV or can you go on radio or hope that your book gets published by huge publishing corporations who have political interests too. Whereas now, YouTube is just one example, but it's a it's a platform where you could just go and speak to the people. And I think, and even though we've, we've had YouTube for a while and we've had the internet and that, I think these, I think history shows with new technologies, they take a while to start impacting us. And I think we haven't seen anything yet. And I do believe like those examples where 
we could hold elections on various things and referendums either on social media or and then we could show that well well hang on you said your approval rating is 80 percent well we're showing here it's 40 percent or and I'm, again this is some this is sounding simplistic because i haven't got it thought up but i'm just giving examples where there's going to be ways where we could affect change in multiple ways and i think we have to move away from this rigid narrow idea that our only way is to vote every four years and then when we don't like things to scream rant and rave for the next four years <clears throat> And then when we get our guy in power, it's still the same. And so I think we have to get out of this left-right paradigm. Because uh, really nothing is that simple. I think if you take the average right-wing voter, or you take the average left, and really break down their life. Like, okay, you're so you're left-wing, but you're a businessman. So you support entrepreneurial stuff. See, see, I would, here's an example. And, and then they might be a humanitarian. They're giving to charities. They believe in some socialism, so that's left. I think most people are actually left and right on various things, and I don't think, like I've given you the example, there's no there's there's no major party in the U.S. that has left wing politics overall. The shades of it um, in the Democrats with things like. Uh, small things and when I say small I don't mean this in a demeaning way but I mean in terms of what can affect the greatest number of people and change our lives small things when it comes to like uh, equality issues and things like that now those I understand those are big on in many ways and they are but they're nothing compared to something like if we could uh, free up the hidden wealth in the world if we could stop wars these are things that would a lot of the angriness and nastiness and people is actually people fighting over scraps and that can even lead to people being angry at immigrants minorities all these things that a lot of that can actually come it's well known for example when times get tough and hitler picked on this but many others have too when times get tough with economies the first groups to be blamed are immigrants and gradually you could just work through the list different minorities are picked on now i believe in these i'm all for all these equality issues uh and 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 ventures to move us towards that as long as they're not politically correct or as long as it, as long as it's results oriented and we're not forcing people to we're not forcing minority groups to be given certain prestigious situations when they haven't it has to be on merits too is what i'm saying but apart from that i'm all for those things but i also think the situation uh the situation the world is in can actually lead to some of the stuff that that trump is sort of he's recognizing that people are angry at they're blaming immigrants or they're angry at certain minorities and that and i, and I don't necessarily believe he, he may i i know we don't really know what Donald Trump's like as a person. He may not be, the rumors are he's not racist at all. Um, and he's got no beef with immigrants, but he's probably so power mad that he just wants, he would say anything to, so if he picks up that enough of the population are angry at those things, he will milk that. But so what I'm getting at is, I believe though the big issues are the fact that we're fighting over scraps we start blaming other groups because there's not enough opportunity for each person and the world should have much more opportunity and it can anyone who tells you that it can't have these things easily meaning things like universal health care <clears throat> things like no one ever homeless it not only anyone who tells you that it can't we can't have those are lying but anyone who tells you we can't have those easily are lying too we can definitely have that there is way more than enough money for everybody okay not just money but opportunity work you know but but the fact is our leaders and our and i think deep down in our guts even if our logic tells us no no there's not we can't have enough you know blah blah, blah. we've got to put resources aside you've got to budget it and all that even if you start thinking logically i think we can all fill in our guts when we look around and see the world uh, the fact that we can put someone on the moon, all those things, right? I think we can kind of feel, yeah, there, you know what? This world is set up to to be, somehow the current system is it's set up to be unfair, but it's not organic. And it's the same th idea I've got with, um, with overpopulation. That's a bit of a moot point because 
it's still to be determined whether the world is overpopulated or whether the world is set up in such a way that it's so unfair that it seems overpopulated and 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 i'll give you an ex a lot of people could react to that because overpopulation has become such a um it's become such a belief that's been pr promoted in the media and all those things and I'm not saying it's definitely untrue, but I think we should question it because, for example, in the 1960s, the population was only about three or four billion. And back then they were saying, you know, one more billion, that's it, the world, you know, it never hits its limit. We can always hold more. But the point is with the population we've got now, I believe we could have double that and we will get to double that, right? And there's no – countries have tried to uh, – bring in measures like China's brought in uh, one child policy Japan had three child policy I believe uh, a few others have had those but they're against human nature now I'm not saying as populations become more educated yeah they they propagate less there's, there's examples like that as they become less religious sometimes there's uh, you know there, there are fluctuations and all that but we, the point is we are going to as wealth increases too, we are going to, people are going to live longer as well. All those things we are going to propagate more. So rather than saying this useless thing like we're just overpopulated, that's it. I think it's better to look at actually challenge that model and say, well, are we actually not managing our resources properly? And, and what if we had fairer distribution of resources and the key thing for me is what if we i'm focused on my main thing is more what's best for the globe we need to start that's the other thing with politics is this idea about it works fine if you've got a small country like new zealand or papua new guinea or sweden if you say okay we're going to do what's best for our country that's okay you've got little populations there of a, of a five million or less okay that's fine but it doesn't work so well when the president of the united states say the Prime Minister of Britain said, come hell or high water, we're going to do what's best for our country. Because the problem with that is what happens if certain policies are best for America but sabotage the whole world? And, I th and, and China's, China and Russia are in this category too where these big countries – We've actually got, and, and people within those countries need to actually start saying this, and I believe this will come, but it's about thinking more as a globe. There's a good type of globalism and a bad type of globalism. There's one where um, you could design like the, you know, the much predicted new world order where everything, you know, but then there's a good sort where humanity can be one. And I believe there's a way that we can work politics where it's best for our own country, but not, there needs to be a caveat that it's not at the detriment of other countries. And I think, unfortunately, America has lost a lot of its goodwill since it um, rescued at least much of the Western world in World War II. And you know, stood up for what was right. It had so much goodwill, 1945. I think since a lot of the wars and and measures like what I talked about with the um, with the World Bank and so on, a lot of those decisions have led to um, America being America's politics actually affecting much of the world. And I believe we're going to start as China and and Britain, going back before the U.S. right, I think the U.S. was copying the British model. The British Empire was exactly the same. So that we're not singling out one country, but it's just over the last half century or so, America has been arguably the last, the only superpower really, particularly militarily. Um, and so, so now we, I think, in future we're going to be looking at China, Russia, where we're going to be saying the same things. So well, hang on, China. What's best for you is not necessarily what's best for the world. So we need to somehow figure this out. And that's where Trump's thing about make America great again. Yeah, good into a point. But I think as Americans too become more global and, and it actually is in America's interest for the world. to. This is what's got to be understood. It's like we're all in this together. It's, it's like if you're in an office, it's teamwork. Or if you're in any sort of team, you can't sabotage other people on the planet. You know, if you take bring this back to global politics, we can't be sabotaging certain nations because it actually doesn't help us. We think it does, but it doesn't. So 
it should be make America great again and make the world great again. Because right now, you know, uh, and and the same with make China. You know, China needs to rise up and it deserves to. It was it was actually under the thumb of the Western world and so a lot of the, there's there's good arguments to say it was stunted in its growth. Um, but now. We need to be careful with China and Russia too, and probably India as well, where these big nations need to be kept in line. And the more glo- that's where the more globally aware their citizens can be, and we can actually start saying, well, hang on, if you start this war in uh, another war in Afghanistan, or if you go into Iran, what does that do for the rest of the world? And sure, we want to look after ourselves, but we also recognise there's a blowback, and not I'm not just talking military blowback. But just if if countries lose their goodwill, that can eventually lead to trade moving to other areas. That can, you know, when American citizens go overseas, I've travelled with some of them, and, and I've actually had to defend some of them because there's so there is actually a lot of hate towards Americans now, globally, and it's sad. And it's and I've explained to them, look, most America, I've actually 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 had to explain to foreigners that most Americans don't want war. Don't confuse, don't confuse. The um, the U.S. political class with the American people, okay, and and that sort of thing. So Americans go to other parts of the world to uh, how can you say it? Let's say they want to further. They've they've got some job they want to do in Europe or somewhere. Well, they may not be treated as well as other uh, nationalities for example i'm a new zealander and because new zealand has very little sway anywhere i go in the world people immediately go oh wow and and it's and it's like new zealand maybe stands for something because it actually is anti-nuclear it is it's sort of stood up for a lot of the right things and so i've experienced the reverse of this where you actually get because of your nationality you actually get goodwill um, people, you're not a threat. You're not an en- You're not viewed as an enemy of any any groups. And don't get me wrong, we should be an enemy to people who tr- who try to thwart democracy. And that, that is, you know, that and the U.S. being the biggest military power deserves to stand up against some of these things. But then on top of that, there are many other issues where we need to be honest that these superpowers have done a lot of things wrong in the world. Um, and the fact that some of what Trump's talking about, he's saying that China's taking jobs, but I know for a fact that other nations are actually deciding to deal with other countries. They're moving their business and their focus more to Asia, Russia, because it's not just that they feel they get a bit... Trump's implying that China is offering the best manufacturing, and that's true, all that granted. No one can compete with China on that sort of stuff. But... There are other countries that are going, we're going to get fairer treatment politically and morally with with other parts of the world. And that's how low America has sunk. And that, and that's and, and many people voting in the US, I don't believe, understand. And again, it's not an insult. I've never found um, I've never found differences in in intellect or morals in anywhere in the world I've traveled, I believe all the people are the same. And I'm, I just believe the U.S. is such, going back to one of my original points, the U.S. is such a um, massive population, a massive area where people don't need to focus. It's kind of like a very internal world. People don't need to focus on much of the rest of the world. Where, whereas I'll give you an example, growing up in New Zealand, our news, at the time I was growing up, I think it was less than 3 million people, okay, the population. So you watch the news, the New Zealand's news is about 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes. Then we've run out of news. I'm not kidding. Sometimes they were scraping the barrel. Okay. So then it would just be pathetic little news stories. Then they go to the world. The world news I remember as a kid would be about half an hour. And straight away from the youngest age, I can remember focusing on all sorts of global politics, all um, stories, and, and you learn about geography, cultures, all that stuff. Uh, I've watched the US news, they can barely fit in five minutes of world news because there's so much going on there. And so what that creates that internal thing, and I think this is where, um, going back to one of one of my other original points, I think 
they can do scare tactics with where they can say social social socialist policies do not work anywhere in the world. Well, I'm standing one right now, and I can tell you. This is a, Australia is a capitalist country. It's very similar to American politics on many levels, and yet we have many successful social um, socialist policies right here, okay, in this country. And I've lived in an, in a couple of others like Ireland and and England, which are exactly the same, okay. But but the problem is if if people aren't as globe uh, globally aware, then they don't get this. And I'm, and again, I'm just lucky. I feel fortunate that I was I was born in a country that's small and isolated, where I needed to th I needed to go overseas also to do some of the stuff I wanted to do career-wise. Um, but I also had to be focused. There wasn't much going on in my country, so I had to be focused. But all I'm saying is that's nothing. I'm not putting down on anyone or, or building myself up here because what I'm trying to say is that's just pure luck. Where you're born is luck. Um, and so going back to just quickly my final point about uh, politics is what do we really do, how do we deal with, and post your comments below if you think I'm way off, you can tell me, if you agree with some of you got differing ideas, or if you can, <clears throat> what would be really good is if you can share with me what what other ideas could we, what other ways could we enforce our will on the politicians, either within the political system, like that idea of referendums, or outside of it completely? Is, are there ways we could do, is there some sort of alternative to politics where we can change? And I'm going to give the example of charities. What if they were built up much bigger than now? And they could do things like, let's say we worked out, okay, we've got a... Um, in the state of Nevada, we've got a homeless cri homelessness crisis. Could we just have a vote online? And if 90, let's say 90% of people say, yeah, we should pour money into this. This is wrong. Could we just, you know, uh, it, could we fill in the gaps where politicians do nothing? Things like that. Or could we somehow, via orchestration online, could we somehow enforce, I don't know if the word is blockades or um, some some sort of way where we can, when, when there's a real wrong going on, like people just do not want another war, would there be a way to just outside, within and outside of the political system, would there be a way to, um, by huge action groups or something, would there be a way to prevent certain things or at least I'm thinking of an equivalent to the 1960s where there was so many people outside the White House and that marching and I don't believe marching is necessarily that could be part of the modern solution but I think people are too much on the online level now to get involved in that um, are there ways where the equivalent of that where we could make it heard to such an extent um, and I'm, I guess we're seeing some that maybe we're seeing some of this now, by the way, with this anger towards this immigration splitting up families under under the Trump administration. Maybe we're seeing the beginnings of ways to challenge political power. Um, so yeah, if you can post all that and let me know. And and as I was saying, I'm I'm just trying really here to begin. To, in my own way, whatever my shortcomings are, to just begin the conversation, and hopefully you guys can take it further and finish it off for me, because I, I feel I've got about a five percent grasp of this, but I do feel strongly in my gut that it's not worth, it's not worth getting caught up in all this stuff, because on the individual level we're being weakened by giving our power away. So thanks, guys. Cheers.